I want to ask you something personal. But before I do, I want you to imagine that sitting next to you is your mother or father, or maybe your grandparents. Okay. Are you ready? Here goes. Do you masturbate? If you have a hard time answering, you're not alone. I've spent over seven years interviewing anyone I can get my hands on, from educators to porn stars to sexual revolutionaries, even a former Surgeon General, on topics ranging from history to politics to health and education, or lack thereof. He was bullied so badly over that video that he committed suicide. I've done this in order to understand a question that has bothered me for years. Why is something most everybody does so hard to talk about? We know that 80 to 90% of men masturbate, 65 to 70% of women masturbate, and the rest lie. So what, so what are we going to talk about? Masturbation, 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 masturbation. Choking your chicken. Spanking the monkey. Double clicking the mouse. Blasting off. Catch your bunny. Backing off. Hand to gland combat. I like that one. Some call it self abuse. Give me a break. Wanking, wanking, wanking. It's masturbation, that is the word. When people ask me why I am making a documentary on masturbation, I tell them it started as a joke. No, not masturbation, it's sex with someone I love. We laugh at masturbation, like we laugh when someone trips on a banana peel. We laugh because it makes us uncomfortable. I recalled a conversation with someone. He said that masturbation was like hemorrhoids. Just because it existed doesn't mean people want to talk about it. Was masturbation so disgusting and painful that it could be compared to hemorrhoids? I've been obsessed with masturbation for as long as I can remember. I had my first masturbation experience when I was five. I was playing show and tell with several of the neighborhood girls. I showed them how to do it, but for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how they did it. Women's hot spots are kind of in the little folds there and not as easy to find. Susie Bright has this great line about saying she never, she never met a man who didn't know where his penis was and didn't know how to have an orgasm, right? Whereas she's met thousands of women who have no idea where their clitoris is and don't know how to have orgasms. I think men are more comfortable with admitting they masturbate because I think it's more accepted. Men and women are socialized in fundamentally different ways around masturbation. Male genitalia is really out there. You sort of can't miss it. And women are born with a vulva and it's internal. So for us to actually figure out what's going on takes a bit more work. The clitoris is the only organ designed in the human body exclusively and only for pleasure. And for most women, it is their best bud. There is no doubt about it. Ducky Doolittle actually once said, the clitoris is the center of the fucking universe. Almost every woman can have an orgasm through her clitoris, and, and studies show that as few as 24% of women can orgasm from penetration alone. Women have a lot more nerve endings than men, or at least they're more centrally focused. Normally, men have between four and 5,000 nerve endings, where women have 8,000 in their clitoris. So there's a big difference in the sensation. We all know the stories of too tight pants, sitting on a washing machine riding ponies when you were a girl and how exciting that is. You talk to women and ask them what they humped when they were little, they'll be like, oh my god, I can't believe I humped that too. You know, they hump a lot of stuff. It's wonderful being a girl. 
Clit's rule <laughs> in the female sexuality world. And let's hear it for penis tops as well. I was never taught about masturbation and sex in Catholic school, but I was taught about lust and sin. There are no circumstances under which we can condone masturbation. It's what we call a moral absolute. I was in religion class when I discovered a hole in my pants pocket that allowed me to touch my penis without anyone knowing. It's a sin of owning the masturbatory crime. Feelings of guilt mixed with feelings of pleasure, but I couldn't resist. The good feelings outweighed the bad. I wondered what other religions had to say about masturbation and whether they also viewed it as a sin. No, masturbation is not a sin. Masturbation has been indicated as a deviation. If God didn't want us to masturbate, he would have made our arms shorter. It is a sin because it's an abuse of what sex ought to be. From a Buddhist perspective, the question of masturbation has to do with, well, what's our intention? Does masturbation bring us closer to reality? Look at the nature of desire and see if it really brings you the happiness you seek or not. Based on the Quran and the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, masturbation is classed as a minor deviation because the person is not uh, harming anyone else. In that case, according to the Quranian laws, he has chosen a lesser evil. The lesser two evils principle does not apply there. In the Jewish tradition, not so clear cut, Masturbation is not listed among the negative commandments, but mistakenly people believe that masturbation is condemned in the Torah. That is not accurate. It is not mentioned in the Torah, you shall not masturbate. It simply doesn't make sense. So where did we get the idea? From a story in the Torah in Genesis of a guy by the name of Onan. When Onan's brother died, God uh, commanded Onan to marry his brother's wife. He didn't want to have children. Maybe I can convince him. Because they would not be his children. And so he decides... He would pull out and withdraw before he ejaculated. And spill his seed. What he did do was ejaculate uh, not in a woman, ejaculate outside a woman, which is similar to the way you ejaculate in masturbation. That somehow morphed into masturbation is a sin. It's a controversial subject. They call masturbation onanism. It's simply inaccurate. And now I'm stuck in a bad situation. I'm the poster child for masturbation. If God made sex the only way to procreate the human race, what do all these religious people have to be afraid of? The fear is that if we masturbate, we will replace intercourse and human connection with masturbation. So they had to create all these mythologies about the horrible dangers of masturbation. Sex is for procreation, and pleasure is an incentive. If it doesn't cause suffering, then you can masturbate all you want. But that doesn't give us reason to justify it. But it can be justified, because today, technology allows us to procreate through masturbation. I think I'm probably responsible for somewhere between 75 and 100,000 children being brought into this world. You see, I'm a andrologist, and I study men, and therefore I study their sperm which is acquired through masturbation. No, the act is still wrong. Many people are taught that masturbation is a sin, whether it be in Judaism or Islam or any other religion. Guilt is really intense. It's always wrong. My Catholic upbringing influenced the shame and guilt that I feel about masturbation, even to this day. I remember the summer before high school being called a jerk off for admitting that I masturbated. The rumors went around that I was a pervert. I felt like Hester Prynne from The Scarlet Letter, only my letter was a big M. Nobody talked about masturbation in high school. Most of my education about sex came from whatever porn magazines I could wrap my hands around. Two dramatic events took place that really impacted my ideas about masturbation. The first event took place in 1991. Paul Rubens was allegedly caught masturbating in an adult movie theater in Sarasota, Florida. I remember feeling embarrassed for Pee Wee and sad that such a fun person could be so quickly outcast by a world that moments before showered him with love and affection. It reminded me of those days in school when I was made to feel bad for admitting that I masturbated.
Every year, the biggest musical act opens this award show. This particular year, Masturbation did. Ladies and gentlemen, MTV is proud to introduce... Heard any good jokes lately? And MTV just made the biggest statement to young people around the world. <laughs> Paul Rubens is like the poster man of the culture's tweaky antipathy about masturbation. Heard any good jokes lately? There's a lot of things about me you don't know anything about, Daddy. Things you wouldn't understand. Things you couldn't understand. Things you shouldn't understand. 1991, July 26. Paul Rubens, on all accounts, was in Sarasota, Florida, visiting his parents. His hair's long, he's got a beard. He's not looking like a peewee. Peewee's Playhouse had actually just wrapped. The series was actually officially over. Anyway, he's in the porn theater watching this triple feature, and then the cops come in. Freeze, come back! That's when I decided to take the law into my own hands. What else are people doing in those theaters? He's in an adult theater touching himself, and he should do this somewhere else? Isn't that what those places are for? And if the media hadn't made a circus out of it, no one would have been the wiser. We were having so much fun. After his arrest and that photo of him made the rounds, um, his career was basically ruined. If the internet had been as big then as it was now, this would be a viral phenomenon. And of course the issue was our antipathy toward masturbation, but more importantly, our terror around childhood sexuality. People really took this seriously. Like this was really a shameful, ridiculous thing. Nobody wanted to support peewee products. All of these sponsorships got lost, all this big thing, because he jerks off. <laughs> It was that connection, that line that was drawn between masturbation as a sexual sin, quote unquote, and the fact that he talked to children and it was an icon for children. What? That would have been a great opportunity to teach kids about something that should be considered healthy. I almost think of him as one of the first rocks off the cliff of the tabloidization of well-known people's sexuality. The media has as dysfunctional a view of masturbation as uh, the general public. Of all the wars, all the political unrest, all of the abuse of human rights that are going on in this world at any given moment, and one celebrity is caught masturbating in a public porn theater, that's the big headline? Life can be so unfair. It's unfortunate that that character is, you know, marred by this one incident. You're hosting a kid show on television. And you just caught masturbating in a theater. I mean, you just kissed that show goodbye. I think we lost a beloved children's character. It's time to go. I mean, I mean Pee Wee Herman. Hi, Pee Wee. The second event that really influenced my ideas about masturbation took place three years later in 1994. It was the firing of the Surgeon General. Dr. Joycelyn Elders for taking a positive stance on teaching about masturbation in schools. She was later forced to resign by the same president who made the executive decision to play hide the cigar with his intern. We in America can't talk about sex. We can do it, but we can't talk about it. Good Vibrations started National Masturbation Month specifically because of Dr. Joycelyn Elders' firing. Well, when I was asked a question at the UN at World AIDS Day, if I felt that we should teach children about masturbation, I felt it would reduce unintended pregnancy and reduce disease. My answer to that is yes. And all of a sudden, the first female African-American Surgeon General the country has ever had gets canned because she said something sensible. In regard to masturbation, I think that that is something that uh, it, it's a part of human sexuality and it is a part of something that perhaps should be taught. She got fired because I think President Clinton thought he was gonna lose some of his base. She is a person of great energy and conviction and she's devoted her life to child health and uh, reducing teen pregnancy and fighting AIDS, but there have been a number of things where we just have different positions. It's one of the worst moments in our country's history, and I say that mindfully. That just shows some of the backward mentality of some of the idiots that run our country. It really represented the phobia that America has about sexuality. We have more sexually transmitted infections. We have more 
teenage pregnancies. Our incidence of HIV disease is higher than in sub-Saharan Africa. And the fact that we can't really have any kind of real public discourse about sexual education in this country um, is very, very disturbing. It seems bizarre that we wouldn't teach kids about a perfectly safe way to have sex, which is masturbation. You know, why wouldn't you teach them that? Because we are afraid if we tell them about it, they'll do it. I can't think of anyone that I admire more for taking a positive stand that masturbation should be taught in the public schools. I was not the president's Surgeon General. I was not the Congress's Surgeon General. I was the people's Surgeon General, and I was going to do what I felt was the right thing for the most people of this country. The firing of the Surgeon General and President Clinton's hypocrisy and failure to back her up infuriated me. What's so wrong about education around masturbation? What do we have to fear? The curriculum at my school, I've been told, has been the same for the past, I don't know, 25 years or so. It's an abstinence-based curriculum. In my mind, it's very outdated. Masturbation, it's a natural, normal thing, but people try to ignore it and avoid it. So people say, oh, we can't talk to young people about sex because it might give them ideas and I have a clue for them is that Mother Nature has already beat you to the punch. There is very limited coverage on masturbation. There is no masturbation education. They don't talk about female masturbation at all in our curriculum. That went out with the attempt made by our former Surgeon General. We can talk about abstinence. We can talk about not doing it or how to prevent pregnancy or sexually transmitted infections, but we certainly can't talk about pleasure. We live in a very anti-pleasure culture, particularly sexual pleasure. We're in a political agenda that's driving sexuality education into a very harmful state for young people. So right now in the United States, it's a bad time for sex education. Masturbation is still being educated as something abnormal, not appropriate. It's called abstinence only before marriage. It's highly funded by the federal government, and it preaches and teaches moral messages and not accurate, safe, sensitive information. The Bible says that lust in your heart is committing adultery. So you, you can't masturbate without lust. You still think masturbation is wrong? Oh, let's not even go there. Um, you know, Why are you I, in there? Are you the pro-masturbation talk show host? <laughs> uh, yes, why not? Uh, yes. The problem is that there is a political will to not talk about sex. All it says is wait until you get married, period. I don't think any intelligent person is going to think that if you mention masturbation to kill kids, they're going to run wild in the street masturbating. That's what I thought, too, until I discovered in Fremont, California, parents were actually gathering with the hopes of having a sex education book removed from the high school curriculum. The Fremont School District plans to use a new book to teach sex education, but some say that book is too graphic. I think that the Your Health Today book is a very modern, up-to-date, approachable book for students. There were people who put together um, a petition, and they had concerns about the age appropriateness of this particular textbook, things like masturbation or um, how to properly put on a condom. I'm gonna read from it for a minute. It just says, masturbation is self-stimulation of the genitals for sexual pleasure. The stigma attached to masturbation is left over from a previous era when it was considered sinful and dangerous to one's health, probably because its purpose was pleasure rather than procreation. Sexual education begins in the home of parents. Children are learning by watching their parents. They're the role models. If the parents are uptight, conservative, aren't going to speak about it, children are going to feel some guilt about their normal bodily functions. I got a little slip of paper from one student asking, uh, if you masturbate too much, could you give yourself herpes? How can my child even think that feels good? He shouldn't even know he has that thing down there. Even worse, if they're being made to feel ashamed about masturbation and that masturbation is dangerous. I have an announcement to make. We have discovered why there are so many unexplained deaths in the world. Each time a man masturbates, another man dies. So from now on, masturbation is illegal. Not dumping our fear onto the child is the first step to not messing up young kids. The healthiest perspective that I think a parent can take is that their child is a sexual being and that we don't have to quash them at all. 
I don't think it's our job to encourage our children to be sexual beings. Oh, Ricky, I did see what you were doing. We let them develop and we let them grow. It felt good, didn't it? I'm just glad you're doing this in the privacy of your own room. Kids should not be punished, nor should kids not be answered if they want to know a sexual question. If you do that, who are they going to ask? Anybody else but you for the rest of their lives. We've got to be honest. We've got to educate them. And we've got to teach them to be responsible. And you can't be responsible if you don't know. I graduated in 1996, the same year the movie The People vs. Larry Flint was released. The film seemed to speak out against the repressive attitudes that plagued the 90s blackballing of Paul Rubens and the firing of Dr. Joycelyn Elders, and was based on the life struggle of hustler founder Larry Flint, who fought hard against sexual repression. We live in a free country, but there is a price for that freedom, which is that sometimes we have to tolerate things that we don't necessarily like. I want a unanimous decision in 88. It's too bad that they won't hear a lot of these other cases uh, involving human sexuality. My parents told me nothing about masturbation. There are people who oppose masturbation. Don't know what they're talking about. Or number two, they don't know what they're missing. This young guy walked up to me, put one out of after his book, he stuck out his hand and he said, Mr. Flint, I just want to thank you for helping me make it through puberty. So what he's really telling me is he spent a lot of time jerking off the hustler over the years. So go back in that room where you are free to think whatever you want to think about Larry Flint and Hustler Magazine. Ooh, Hustler Magazine. Hustler is a magazine most widely read by one hand. In many ways, I'm uh, contributing to the development of their sexuality by uh, giving them an outlet. Uh, that's why uh, Hustler is so important and such a terrific tool to use when you masturbate. I saw Larry Flint as a revolutionary, willing to fight against the history of sexual repression, a history that seemed to contradict our own natural instincts. The history of masturbation goes back to when man first was created. As an evolutionary biologist and someone who studies um, the behavior of other animals, I can say that I think we can learn something about our own sexuality from studying the behavior of our closest living relatives. In a wide array of primates, they masturbate just like humans do. I could say that we have a very, very long ancestral history of the practice of masturbation. When we crawled out of the primordial soup as soon as we were dexterous or whatever. How many millions or billions of years ago, people probably started touching themselves. It's just part of the human condition. It's occurred as far back as the Egyptian hieroglyphics were done, around 1500 BC. The Greeks um, and the Romans uh, talk about it, but it's basically talked about as a joke. It's American Pie kind of humor. Then, sometime around 1712, an anonymous book was published, which is called Onania. The author of this book was a man named John Martin. That unnatural practice by which persons of either sex may defile their own bodies without... The second part of the book, that all the medical consequences that happen as a result of masturbation. Everybody that was sick did it. Maybe it was causing the sickness. If you masturbate, you're going to suffer horrible effects. It causes insanity. You will go blind. You will deplete your body of its life force. So it's basically like an article we might write today about crack cocaine. This is crack. It's the crack cocaine of sex. There's certainly a good number of Victorian doctors who recommended instruments to prevent masturbation, the cock rings with nails, the electrified panties that sound an alarm at the first signs of an erection. Sylvester Graham and John Kellogg, funny guys. Kellogg and Graham were both really about healthy diets and a healthy lifestyle that only included sex once a month if you had to do it at all. It is my scientific conclusion that sex is unnecessary and dangerous. They believed that sexual activity 
was really deteriorating to your health. So if you're you know, losing semen, you're exhausting your body and you're therefore opening up for the chance of greater disease or death. You cannot afford the loss of life-given fluids. The core scientific idea about masturbation is that semen was this rare, precious, refined fluid that it took 40 ounces of blood to generate one ounce of semen. Graham made graham crackers and Kellogg made cornflakes, not the kind that you eat today. They have way too much sugar and refined flour. They would not approve of the way their foods have come out, but they made these really bland tasting foods, thinking this would help curb sexual appetite. Kellogg even went further than that and did perform at least one clitoridectomy on a young girl whose parents thought that if they didn't remove her clitoris, she would destroy their family and all of their siblings would get this idea that it was okay to masturbate. Uh, may I have a volunteer, please? Oh, come on, don't be shy. Hysteria in the 1800s, it was like a catch-all term that if a woman was too outspoken, if she was irritable, that was linked under hysteria for women and linked to like hyster, uterus, linked to their reproductive system. Women would go to their doctors and the way the doctors would treat hysteria was to manually stimulate their vulvas to bring release of hysteria, which was orgasm. <laughs> That particular kind of massage was not considered sexual, and that the uh, paroxysm that resulted, aka orgasm, was not considered sex. So as the story goes, the doctor's hands were getting tired <laughs> of masturbating the women, and that's when they developed the first steam-powered vibrator, like this huge device. Women would come to the doctor's office, cost about $200 in the late 1800s, which was a lot of money, and have a session where they would be blasted with these vibrations until they got off and were essentially cured of their hysterical weight. That's a very interesting history because uh, doctors had been doing it for centuries until the advent of the electric vibrator. Once they were electrified and smaller, women realized they didn't have to pay their doctor to do it for them anymore. Over time, vibrators became the fifth appliance to be electrified behind like the toaster, the sewing machine, and the tea kettle. Vibrators were found in Sears Roebuck catalogs, in Needlecraft magazines. And then in the late 1920s, because the first vibrator made an appearance in an adult film, all vibrator ads were quickly removed from magazines. Even some of our most revolutionary thinkers struggled to come to terms with masturbation throughout history. Freud is pretty negative about masturbation. I mean, he saw it as a major cause of neurosis, and he really felt that the full regular sexual act uh, with the ejaculation in the vagina was the only thing that was completely natural and healthy for males and females. But what Freud says is that, look, masturbation is an important part of puberty, both for boys and girls, but that for adults, you quit this having sex with yourself and they start having to understand that that's not what their bodies are meant for. Now there's a change in the weather, there's a change in the sea. My first introduction to human sexuality uh, and to masturbation for that matter was the Kinsey Report. I think Kinsey was a pioneer. Uh, I think he was the first person who actually looked at sexual behavior in America. I think that he brought sexuality into the public media and I think his work was priceless. I think it's very important to understand that when Alfred Kinsey studied sexual behavior, masturbation was regarded as its own unique and appropriate and healthy sexual outlet. Kinsey was the first person to actually go out and survey the average person, man and woman, about these kinds of things and brought this taboo out of the um, closet. He normalized this behavior for the masses who were already doing it but feeling somewhat like they were alone. Do you find my answers typical? Am I normal? Am I normal? Kinsey, I'd say, really is a key figure in, in liberalizing things. I mean, he writes about data that said 90 plus percent of males masturbate at some point in their life. And after that, professional claims against masturbation really just collapsed. What he did is he actually sanctioned masturbation, going away from the, the, the shame-based 
pejorative way of viewing masturbation as something that was sick and shameful and dirty and bad and wrong to something that was a healthy sexual outlet for expression. Liberation is here. No area of male-dominated American culture is spared. Equal rights for women. In the 60s, with the rise of feminism, and books like Our Bodies, Ourselves, it becomes part of the rise of the clitoral orgasm. One of the things we certainly put in all of our editions of Our Bodies, Ourselves are the many varied ways that women use to self-pleasure. <music> Encouraging women to learn how to masturbate is about encouraging women to be their own human beings and to feel entitled to participate in society in ways maybe they hadn't felt entitled to. It's not just the act of pleasuring yourself sexually. It's about power. So a lot of this early feminist movement is focused on clitoral orgasm, which is focused on masturbation. And Betty Dodson took this one step further and argued, look, this is the foundation for female sexuality. This is a way of expressing our sexuality. Everything else is an add-on. Dodson invented masturbation. There was no masturbation before Dodson. Thank you. Thank you for being here to see an old masturbating lady, for God's sake. <laughs> I went public with masturbation. I was one of the first women on the planet who talked openly about liking masturbation and the importance of it. She had groups of women masturbating together. For some women, that was incredibly freeing because it was, yes, this is something that's mine that I can do and that I'm sharing it in a circle of women. She has really fought like crazy for 35 years to bring the concept of self-love as a perfectly valid, equally important aspect of uh, person's sexuality. And so Betty really recognized what masturbation meant to women on such a fundamental level in terms not only of their own ability to be sexually fulfilled, but also what that meant in terms of their relationships and their choices that they might make. And it's not that people say, oh, I want to thank you for teaching me how to masturbate. I want to thank you for liberating me. I want to thank you for giving me a wonderful sex life with my husband. We're having a renaissance. It's fabulous. As she got to be the mother of masturbation, I think she came to learn more and more and more that men didn't all feel good about masturbation either. And the fact is, masturbation is a healthy part of everybody's sex life, and Betty was the first person to really, really stand up and say that and not stop saying it ever. I am a fucking pioneer. Despite much progress, it seems that shame and fear from our sordid history with masturbation continues to affect us today. My name is Julio Shorio. I'm a commercial photographer, and this is my exhibit. It's um, called Faces of Ecstasy, Real People, Real Orgasms. There are a series of photos of people's orgasms, fully clothed from about chest up. I am about to be photographed mid-orgasm, and I'm going to masturbate. And I'm going to call him over when I'm ready. G. And he's going to come shoot me in the middle of it. a study on human sexuality and just being human. People giggle. Some people walk away in disgust. These are all normal people. The banker, the teacher, the electrician. Everybody does it. Your grandma does it. I've never gotten the sense that music was sort of anti-masturbation. Many songs have been written about masturbation or reference it in some way with a euphemism of some sort. Search myself, I want you to find me. I forget myself, I want you to remind me. I never really set out to write a song about masturbation. It was really playing with words for me more than really playing with myself. Oops, don't use that. I think part of the appeal of the song, I Touch Myself, is that Certainly, it says something openly about something that is uh, repressed in our society, no question about it. 
If you want a love song, there's like hundreds of thousands of them, but if you want a song about masturbation, there aren't too many of them. Uh, I'm Keith, I'm the lead vocalist in a band called The Circle Jerks. We came upon the name Circle Jerks in the American Slang Dictionary. Not only did we think that it was funny, but like the Beatles could be a very catchy name. Instead of come together, it's masturbation. I personally have never been involved in a Circle Jerk, but we have got into a bit of hot water over the name, particularly in the Bible Belt. I remember watching on the television, Madonna. Like the Italian police were gonna shut Madonna down because of her simulated masturbation. A month before, she released a book where basically you're inside her vagina, but she does this ooh, 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 over clothing and oh, shut her down. What's going on here? Seriously. The best results seem to be obtained through fantasization accompanied by masturbation followed by ejaculation. It's interesting to see how our ambivalent attitudes about masturbation are also depicted in movies and television. I think almost every instance of masturbation in movies has been displayed as something that's grotesque, that's actually taboo. In The Exorcist, Linda Blair's possessed by the devil, shoving a crucifix in her vagina. It's kind of shocking. I mean, it's either shocking or the other side of it is just to make a big joke of it. The movie American Pie takes the icon of uh, American Pie and fucks it. I gotta say, I wonder if American Pie would have been as popular as it was without that masturbation scene. Copulation with a confection, which is strange. And of course, it's referenced right from the title. If you're, you're supposed to pay attention to the pie. Well, we'll just tell your mother that, uh, that uh, we ate it all. People love scenes like that. Number one is that they, because they do acknowledge that we all masturbate, right? But it also carries a certain amount of shame. It's like you're being caught in an extremely personal moment. One of the best examples is a film called Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Everybody remembers the image of Phoebe Cates coming out of that pool in slow motion and the music. They remember that part. What they forget is that Judge Reinhold's masturbating to that image and then gets caught. Oh, wait just a minute. Anybody fucking knock anymore? That scene is sort of about the anxiety of masturbation more than it is about the pleasure of it, because in fact, most young boys in particular learn to masturbate very quickly because they're afraid of getting caught. I think it brings us back to that pre-adolescent time when we felt we could be made fun of for almost anything we did. Me personally, I don't want to have people see me do it. Unfortunately, I had to do a scene in a movie. In The Truth About Cats and Dogs, I had to masturbate while being on the phone. That scene in the movie was just something that embarrassed me beyond all. I mean, who the hell wants to be masturbating with cameras rolling and a crew around and then an audience sees it? I was absolutely mortified. I did shots of tequila before I did it. It's just too vulnerable. Another instance that comes to mind is American Beauty. What are you doing? If you haven't been caught masturbating, you've been afraid to be caught masturbating. Oh, all right, so shoot me. I was whacking off. That's right, I was choking the bishop, chafing the carrot, you know, saying hi to my monster. It's strange to see that so many instances in movies, um, it's just portrayed as something that one shouldn't be doing. when you knew you were gonna have to do that, is that like, my God, it was It was akin to the experience of watching the movie with my parents sitting next to me. <laughs> so just go uh, clean the pipes and it's a go.
There's Something About Mary has to be one of those unique comedies that actually has sort of a useful take on masturbation. Just get it out of your system so your, your head's clear, you can go on this date and not feel so much pressure to get laid. Is that a hair gel? It's still humiliating in the way that it's shown. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I can use no, 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 don't, 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 you... I just ran out. But it has a real purpose to it. <laughs> TV also has sort of a, a taboo view. In particular, Seinfeld's <sighs> famous episode, The Contest, about who can hold out the longest. I am never doing that again. Oh, like oh you can give me yeah. a break. Yeah. Right. Come on. Come on. You don't think I can? No chance. <laughs> Care to make it interesting? We still laugh about it, but we're talking about it publicly. If you think about it, really, it's kind of a healthy view. They all admit that they masturbate. Sex on television and certainly masturbation on television was fundamentally changed by Sex in the City. Uh-huh. And totally wiped out. Wiped out. That was Charlotte speak for, I'm spending the night with my vibrator. And then her for the friends, they all have an intervention. So it's very funny to think about her becoming addicted to her vibrator, or to masturbation. Regardless of the humor and shame depicted in the media, there's always been big business in getting people off. There are two primary industries that uh, make billions of dollars off masturbation, and that would be pornography and the, and the sex toy industry. I don't think masturbation sells anything, but sex certainly sells. Sure, sex sells, yes, but masturbation also sells. Anywhere between five and 13 billion dollars is spent each year on pornographic material. Masturbation is big business. It's just not often talked about in polite conversation. We are at the Adult Expo in Las Vegas. Titties, dicks, asses, everything. It's what you masturbate to, I know it. You know, the porn industry without masturbation would be a different industry. Certainly porn as we know it in the last 35 years has been primarily um, a medium made by men for men. A lot of guys love just watching girls masturbate. There's, there's been a, adult film, you know, lines where the girls just masturbate. It's like one girl after another and guys love it. At least half of the audience are men who are using it for solo masturbatory purposes. Probably today more than ever, like masturbation's rampant in, in terms of like the internet and technology, you know? I mean, how many guys are jerking off in front of their computers right now as we speak? Internet porn is the rage because why would you want to spend $50 on a DVD when you can masturbate to uh, 25 different websites for $23 a month? A lot of people spend a great deal of time wanking on the internet. There's so much out there. There's something for everybody. I have two favorite porn titles. One was Breast Side Story and the other is Fuck My Aching Tits. <laughs> I mean, just a little earlier, we looked up alien porn, and there are websites that cater to people who fantasize about aliens having sex with women. If you want to just see women with large breasts bouncing on trampoline, we got that movie for you. If you want to see nothing but a bunch of men in a circle jerk, we got that movie for you. I've been in the business of selling sex toys or marital aids for about 25 years. Worldwide, sex toys account for about 1.5 or $2 billion in terms of revenue. There's a, quite a demand out there for quality, sensuous products. And as you can see, there are loads of different kinds of vibrators now to choose from. This is actually sold as, as a ring toss game. Like the rabbit vibrator, and it moves around like this. It's kind of cool, actually. But, um, I don't totally lost my head. <laughs> I'm like vibrator. <laughs> I'm like rabbit. <laughs> you know, sex toys nowadays are very graphic. A lot of them look terrible. I wanted it to be camouflage. You know, guys are into tools. It looks like a flashlight, so it doesn't draw attention. So if somebody sees it, they don't wonder what it is. We've done this in Mocha. We call this Mini Maid. This is the nondescript. It looks like a piggy bank. The hand is usually the best way to go. Every time. Guaranteed. But despite the economic boost generated from this industry, I was surprised to discover that in the state of Alabama, the sale of sex toys is illegal. Do Americans have the right to life, liberty, and sex toys? No, says a federal appeals court in Alabama regarding those last items. I'm Sherry Williams, and 15 years ago, at the age of 28, I decided that Huntsville, Alabama, needed a place for women and couples to shop. In 1998, I get a call from a reporter, and she proceeded to explain that they had just passed a law that banned the sale of adult toys in the state of Alabama. 
The punishment for violation includes being fined up to 10,000 bucks and spending a year in jail. Sherry Williams is the owner of Pleasures, which sell everything from... Lotion. Just can't believe that our politicians sit in Congress legislating whether someone in Alabama has the right to have sex with a harmless um, piece of fun. The law in the state of Alabama says that you cannot sell a vibrator. Sherry Williams, who owns Pleasure Stores in Decatur and in Huntsville, filed suit trying to overturn that 1998 law. What do the people of Alabama passing this law have to be afraid of, especially in a state that has some of the least restrictive gun laws? I really couldn't imagine a state passing such what seemed to be like an archaic law in 1998. Women are clamoring for more ways of having pleasure. Men become often insulted that they can't give their girlfriends an orgasm that only a plastic mechanical device can. Some of those old dudes out there are freaking out about their woman, you know, getting off on a vibrator. Men are outlawing toys that are designed to help women achieve orgasms. And who knows why they would do such a crazy thing. And Viagra is always readily accessible everywhere. Viagra. Talk to your doctor. We're enhancing male pleasure and sexuality. Dude, that is a good thing. But if we're enhancing women's pleasure, sexual, ooh, that's a little uncomfortable. Let's prohibit the sales of sex toys. Over $1.2 million has been spent of taxpayer money to uphold the ban on adult toys. For nine and a half years, we fought this law. And, um, Unfortunately, we lost. I'm breaking the law every day. I keep my doors open. Well, as I've said, I'll stop selling them when they pry them from my gold dead hands. Could Alabama's fear of sex toys be the result of our media's obsession with sex addiction? Actor David Duchovny has entered rehab for it. So, is this a true addiction? My name is Charlie, and uh, my maid says I'm a sex addict. There is no such thing as sex addiction. It's sexual compulsions, not addiction. You're not drinking anything, you're not snorting anything. People engage in compulsive sexual behaviors in order to relieve their anxiety. Chrissy Brinkley accused her ex-husband, Peter Cook, of spending thousands of dollars on internet porn. She did not deserve that. You know, I still really love her and care about her. I'm deeply sorry. Let me just reiterate to my wife how sorry I am that I did these things. New York Governor Elliot Spitzer under fire this week for his involvement. I am resigning from the office of governor. People can be addicted to masturbation just as they can be addicted to two-person sex. With all the hype around sex addiction, it's easy to wonder how much pleasuring is too much. Masturbation, like anything else, can be done in excess. More than once a day would concern most sex therapists. So I'm coming day and night. I mean, it's terrific, right? <laughs> it's not so much a matter of frequency as much as it's how it's getting in the way of one's life. The warning signs would be if you think of sex all the time. Losing weight because you're not eating. You have to call in sick to work. If it is a source of shame, you go into the bathroom at work and masturbate a hundred times a day. And you think about sex to the point where you can't think about anything else. And generally it's so obsessive that it becomes all-consuming. What they need is to get on an antidepressant, which brings that sex drive down. I absolutely don't agree with that. Antidepressants kill your sex drive. If they'd known about Paxil back in the day, they would've been giving that instead of the anti-masturbation <laughs> devices. A lot of people just don't understand sexuality enough to understand when they really are in trouble. When I found out I was HIV positive, actually I was in, pretty much on a spiraling out of control life of Crystal Matthews, and you end up masturbating for 48 hours, 72 hours in a row. It is a problem, a real problem, and those individuals need therapy. And before I know it, I'm totally lubed up from head to toe, and it's 48 hours later, and I'm still trying to find that orgasm, and I can't even get it up. How come you haven't gotten up yet? I'm waiting, sticky. Oh. My name's Joe Matt. I'm an autobiographical comic book artist. A recurring subject matter for me is masturbation and porn addiction. 
I have two books, The Poor Bastard and Spent. Spent is very focused on compulsive masturbation and porn addiction. Well, I wanted to see if I could do it 20 times in a row, have 20 orgasms in a row, just to see if I could. 20 times a day is taking it a bit too far. Yeah, I'm a compulsive masturbator. I have no motivation to keep doing it, but I could keep doing it, uh, you know, after a little, little rest, you know, a little rest, I could do it again usually pretty soon. It's not a big deal. The issues I see with people who have compulsive masturbation are um, the inability to form relationship, the inability to maintain relationships, um, destroying relationships uh, because of lack of intimacy and lack of sexuality. Compulsive masturbation is extremely isolating and it can result in somebody getting so lost in their own world of trying to get the, the best orgasm, how to get off in just the, the right way. People avoid relationships, avoid intimacy, and just masturbate because they're too uncomfortable being with other people, but the masturbation kind of keeps their fears and their anxieties at bay. Maybe the real issue is not how much we are masturbating. Well, let's see. Huh? Ooh. But what we're masturbating to. Let's get some Brazilian fart porn in there. Oh, that's got it. Oh. There's a huge gray area between unhealthy and healthy sexuality and masturbation and fantasies. Masturbation generally involves fantasy, and that can be a really healthy thing. Is it cheating for a married person to masturbate and think about someone other than their wife or husband? Within monogamy, within a committed relationship, with, which in our culture um, presumes monogamy, masturbation is really important because monogamy is difficult. Fantasizing about sex with another woman while you're masturbating is not the same as having sex with another woman. Fantasy is an essential element of how we express ourselves as sexual beings. And without fantasy, most masturbation doesn't really work. If a person is using fantasy to remove him or herself emotionally from the moment, then that, the fantasy is not the problem, but there is a problem. But if the individual says, I'm very happily married, I have a good sex life with my partner, but at times I think about a movie star or some famous person, or even a person who I conjure up, I don't think there's anything unhealthy about it. In fact, what it can do is stimulate that person to enjoy their sexual partner more. What is SAD? SAD is a term that I coined, S-A-D-D, uh, that actually stands for Sexual Attention Deficit Disorder. A lot of it has to do with easy access to internet porn, simply because men are potentially over-masturbating. I love to masturbate as much as possible. Every girl gets pissed off when they catch their boyfriend either masturbating or when they find that magazine in the back of the closet that they never told you they bought. No woman wants her husband fantasizing about somebody else and vice versa. Oh, come on, girls. Oh. So a guy masturbates, enjoys some internet pornography, and then one thing that happens is he doesn't have quite as much desire for his actual real-life partner. Fantasy is part of the fuel of what makes sex delicious and what keeps the fire burning. And there's so much misunderstanding and so much threat and fear around masturbation, especially in coupledom. What the fuck are you doing? Baby. What the fuck are you doing? I was just reading email. No, you weren't. You were watching porno. So I created NoFap on June 20th, 2011. I market it more as a challenge, something you do to temporarily abstain from porn and masturbation or even orgasm altogether temporarily in an effort to um, cure a sexual dysfunction. I don't agree with that. that. That's an impossible limit to put on a mind. Minds go places. It's grown so big that New York Magazine did a story on it, Business Insider, and a few other big ones. And that just goes to show how much of an unspoken underlying issue this is for so many people. It's, it's sticky. <laughs> it's a really sticky area. I wonder if much of our fear about masturbation comes from a fear of our own uncontrollable sexual impulses. Warning, there's a plague infecting our nation. Symptoms may include blindness, weakness, madness, or worse, hairy palms, masturbation madness. This public service announcement has been paid for by Palm, people against lascivious masturbators. He separated the skull from that body and masturbated in front of it. When we talk about masturbation, now we do know that there are there's a core group of serial killers, for example, who really get into the, the fantasy system. In the book, Sexual Homicide, Patterns and Motives, 
Specially trained FBI agents examined the childhood traits of 36 serial killers. Although some of the listed behaviors are disturbing, including cruelty to children and animals, convulsions, and self-mutilation, the three indicators reported with highest frequency are daydreaming, isolation, and compulsive masturbation. There are some individuals who have very, very scary thoughts uh, when they masturbate, and it's very exciting for them, but it's very scary thinking. Jeffrey Dahmer started masturbating to roadkills. He actually would take a dead animal and eviscerate it, and then he would take the sexual organs of the animal and put his penis against the organs and, and, and masturbate. That led him eventually to disemboweling adults, human beings. Posing people who are dead that he killed for pictures, masturbating all over the place. This is Jeffrey Dahmer. Was it simply a coincidence that Pee Wee Herman was arrested just four days after Dahmer, when it was discovered that Dahmer's first offense was masturbating in public? It was somewhat coincidental, but there was some overreaction to Paul Rubens. What he was doing is being done in a lot of theaters across America. But the truth is, masturbation for some men is a gateway to crossing lines. I currently am involved with a fellow who is very methodical about what he's going to do, and he's planning on becoming a serial killer. He's very much involved with compulsive masturbation. I think there's some danger that some fantasies may lead some people who have poor impulse control to actually go act out those fantasies. But I want to find out exactly what are they masturbating to? If they are becoming sexually gratified as they masturbate to the suffering of other human beings, we have a problem. So fantasy is what's going on between our two ears as opposed to our two legs. But studies do link masturbation and violence in the brain. Maybe that's where we got the idea that masturbation could cause madness. But does the link between masturbation and serial killers mean that if we embrace our sexual impulses, that we're all going to run around like masturbating zombies? The concerns of masturbation go beyond the psychological. Masturbation won't cause us to go blind, won't cause hair to grow on our hands. Oh, dude. And we know that we're having sex with somebody we love. It's really good for you. It gives you good skin. It helps you go to sleep. For women, it can relieve PMS. If we don't masturbate, we actually suffer and can cause harm to ourselves. Shut up! Shut up! Healthy and harmful, it could be both. 70% of people report an increased energy level if they abstain from masturbation, and they perform better at work. They're able to exercise more often. I, I don't know, maybe it's a placebo effect, but I'm not going to knock it because it's helping people. Masturbation can be psychologically and physically beneficial, and for many people, I think it can serve as a substitute for a sexual partner. As a young martial artist, I learned about chi and inner energy. I later discovered that this comes into play in how Asian medicine and inner energy arts like Qigong view the potential dangers of masturbation. When a man ejaculates, he loses his will. It's all gone. It's not coming back. Yeah, you have to manage your internal energy. And the biggest energy leak is masturbation. After a man stops masturbating, his whole life changes. All of a sudden, he's not dragging all the time. He's alive. He's happy. He's just not always complaining and being tired and settling for less. You are losing a lot of your life force from your organs and your glands. So that's why it can be very dangerous. There have been a number of studies linking masturbation to prostate cancer that have had contrary scientific results. A colleague of mine named Spring Cooper and I wrote an article for the website The Conversation where we highlighted the health benefits of masturbation. The study that we focused on looked at about 30,000 men, was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and what they ultimately found and concluded was that when men masturbate, they flush out cancer-causing agents in their body, and so it reduces their risk of prostate cancer. Cancer. That's why I was shocked to discover a Cambridge study in 2009 that indicated men in their 20s and 30s that masturbated frequently were more likely to develop prostate cancer. I wondered for the first time, should my documentary come with a Surgeon General warning? Then I remembered, yeah. I had a former yes. Surgeon General in my film. My own mother once said that she prefers stories that dealt with life or death. 
The prostate studies made me realize masturbation could be about life or death. But nowhere did this become more evident than Thanksgiving night in 2013. A San Diego family said video taken of their son in a school bathroom went viral. They said he was bullied so badly over that video that he committed suicide. Matthew Burdett, a former Boy Scout and San Diego High School freshman, committed suicide after a video posted by another student showed Matthew allegedly masturbating in his school stall. The 14-year-old teenager committed suicide after the release of an embarrassing video. The fact that the media called it an embarrassing bathroom video speaks volumes to the charge that we have as a society about masturbation. Weeks of constant bullying caused him... Headlines from three major newspapers failed to mention what he was doing in the bathroom. The video taken at school led to intense bullying. They bullied him. From the bullying, it was two weeks of bullying. We just label things cyberbullying. We label it an embarrassing video because we're too afraid to really look at this issue. It's a real shame that children continue to feel such guilt and humiliation surrounding masturbation. A lot of this is due to adults' discomfort with the topic. Have you been practicing? Children are very, very perceptive. And if an adult is feeling uncomfortable that masturbation is wrong, a child's going to feel that. And they're going to internalize that. And that's how it'll just continue to be perpetrated throughout the generations. I had a really hard time getting in contact with the Matthew Burdett family, teachers that knew him, friends. I finally got the mother of Matthew Burdett, but she didn't feel like the media was portraying him in the right way. She started crying, and I started crying on the phone, and it was very difficult. She just said she wanted to keep his memory sacred. The Burdett story brought back all those painful memories of when I was made fun of as a child for admitting that I masturbated. Only back then it was so much easier. There was no internet to expose your vulnerabilities to the world so pervasively. I couldn't help feeling that had this film been made and released already, that maybe we could have done something to help prevent this young man from taking his life. After seven years making this film, interviewing over 60 of the world's experts on sexuality, learning about the struggles of Dr. Joycelyn Elders, Paul Rubens, Sherry Williams' fight to overturn the sex toy ban in Alabama, it was like, here's a story that seems to tie it all together, yet nobody would talk to me about it. Not my alma mater when I reached out looking for social media interns. Not Burdett's lawyers. Not even the media, who originally broke the story. Though for everyone who refused, thousands wrote in emails, expressing praise and interest in wanting to see this film. The years that I spent making this documentary had taught me a lot about myself and masturbation. There were times when I started to wonder if perhaps the questions I was answering were only leading to more questions. That's because, at its core, masturbation touches upon our deepest, most personal feelings. Our fantasies and pleasures. Our hopes and dreams our insecurities and fears, our desire to be loved, and most important, our need to love ourselves. But if we continue to pass our shame down to future generations, Burdett's suicide won't be the last. Will technology amplify our guilt, resulting in more such deaths, or will our attitudes eventually evolve? I've often wondered, we'll use the orgasmatron. What is the future of masturbation? <laughs> masturbation could bring us together as a society if we will accept it, enjoy it, let go of the guilt and the fear, and just know that we're all sexual. I think that the, the future of masturbation is actually really exciting. I think it's here to stay, just like sex. The future should be that um, there's some doctor-recommended prescription for masturbating. As part of your treatment, I'm going to ask that you masturbate five times a week. Now that's something we can come together on. I can't even guess what the future is going to be. I hope that its future is one that is less shameful. Technology will help people to feel more close to one another and to their own sexuality. The next evolution of internet, there'll be masturbation there too. I feel certain of it. Masturbation and the internet are going to continue to go hand in glove, so to speak, for a very long time in the future. I don't imagine that's going to change. The future of masturbation in terms of technology is a little 
scary. We probably will have masturbatory robots who pleasure us on command. The sex with robots? I can't, I can't wait, personally. <sighs> the future for masturbation, hopefully, will be an, a dialogue that opens up as a result of documentaries like this one. I am hoping that it does get discussed uh, more in the curriculums in the future because I think there are a lot of confused kids out there. I don't see it endangered. Uh, like polar bears. I think the future looks really good for information about masturbation. I think masturbation might be the answer to world peace. Oh, the internet's a future of masturbation. I don't really know. I guess I, I have to say I don't really have a lot of hopes in my lifetime that there'll be a fundamental shift. I would like to think that masturbation could help us as a culture come together literally and figuratively. We can make this world all about self-love because if we loved ourselves, I think that we might be able to get out of some other pretty sticky situations. The future of masturbation is exactly what it is right now, whatever you want to make of it. The future of masturbation is it's here to stay. It's whether we accept it or deny it or pretend it doesn't exist, but believe me, we're not going to ever do away with it. Do you masturbate? <laughs> what? Sure. I can't keep my hands off myself. Of course. I masturbate whenever I get the chance. I have. I'm sure I will. I invented masturbation, as a matter of fact. <laughs> You'd like to know if I masturbate? Sometimes I do. You know, if you, if you walk by a bathroom and there's water running, and you don't hear any plopping, I'm jerking off, probably. No. <laughs> yes. I do. I do masturbate. Oh, I masturbate as often as I can. <laughs> well, occasion. Sure. Occasion. I'm an old man now. So. <laughs> I masturbate at least a couple of times a week. And I'm quite proud of the fact. Yes. Mostly in the shower, on the road, doing stand up comedy. It's very difficult to, to masturbate when you've got a, a baby Bjorn. Every chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta figure that out. As soon as I do, I will, though, as much as possible. All the time, sometimes far too often. Do I masturbate? Absolutely. Unequivocally, as much as possible. 90% <laughs> of men masturbate. And I'm a man. I will let you draw your own conclusions. Absolutely. I do masturbate. Do you masturbate? That's a silly question. That's disgusting. I'm shocked at you, young man. You come here to my house, and here I am, a mature woman, and you ask me if I masturbate? Fucking A, buddy. <laughs> well, now, I didn't say we were gonna tell everything on that, did I? So, any other questions? Um, why do you want to put yourself on camera? <laughs> All right, cut. So, ask me what you wanted to ask me. Do you masturbate? <laughs> Oh, I think I said everything I wanted.